So I guess we can uh, just about begin here. It's uh, the start of the spring quarter, at least at Stanford, at Hoover. Uh, so we welcome Adrienne to the Hoover Economic Policy Working Group as we get started again. We appreciate it greatly. Uh, this uh, is being recorded and will be, be posted on our website afterwards, as will uh, the paper, which you've already gotten a copy of, and the slides, which uh, Adrian will be, be presenting uh, as we speak. Uh, the title of the paper is Demographic Wealth and Global Imbalances in the 21st Century, and it's joint with uh, Hannes Malberg, Fred Martinet, and uh, Matthew Ronley. So, uh, Adrian, you're, the floor is yours. We'll, uh, at, we'll, we might jump in. We have the mechanical hands to alert you and, and uh, me and, and John Cochran. We have the chat room, which is another way to intervene anytime you want. But... Uh, and we'll have, hopefully have plenty of time for, for questions uh, after your formal presentation. So, so welcome, it's great you're here. Great, so thank you so much, uh, John. And um, I'll try to monitor the chat, but please just feel free to jump in. Um, so I'm very honored to be part of this um, uh, working group series. This is a, a paper that's uh, quite a, a Stanford product in that Hannes Malberg is at the University of Minnesota, but he we started this project when he was visiting CEPR um, a couple of years back. And Frederic Martinet is a student of ours in the econ department. And Matt Rogli is my longtime co-author at Northwestern. And in this paper, uh, we're interested in a set of trends, big macro trends that have occurred since the 1950s and the extent to which they are likely to continue in the 21st century. So let me review those trends. So the first trend is that the world population is aging. And this graph shows you the percentage of the population age 50 or above uh, in five countries that together represent 50% of world GDP. And so the, the solid line show you what's occurred between 1950 and today. And the dashed line show you population projections, um, which uh, fortunately won't be too materially affected by COVID. And so when you look in this long horizon, you see there's been a very big uh, and uh, projected to be a very big increase in the share of uh, the 50 plus around the world from somewhere like 20 to 25% early in the sample on average to almost 50% at the end of the sample. Um, but also that the timing has been uneven. Um, and in countries uh, like Japan, the demographic transition is almost over Whereas in countries like China and India, it's only just beginning. And this is something that we're gonna come back to. At the same time, uh, we've, been we've been seeing very large increases uh, in wealth to GDP ratios. So this is as documented by Thomas Piketty and co-authors across these five countries and many other countries, private wealth has risen by 100% or, or more of GDP. We've also seen declines in rates of return on wealth, computed here in the orange line for the United States as the total ratio of capital income and bond income to national wealth in the United States. So that's seen a steady decline since the 1950s uh, from about 6% uh, to about 4% today. Adrian, could I just go yeah. quickly, the wealth to in income, does that include government bonds? Like it, the capital stock doesn't look a whole lot better. So is that just, Lower interest rates pricing things? Is that government bonds? Would... So government bonds are part of it. And also there's valuation effects in it. So, so it's true that capital stocks haven't risen by quite as much. So there's some um, discrepancy between rises in capital stocks and uh, rises in, in measures of national wealth. Uh, okay. Part of it is valuation of land in particular. Um, ah. and, um, and part of it is, is increases in bonds. Uh, that's right. Um, but um, I'll... Um, we, we can address those questions when we come to it as limitations of the framework. Um, and um, we have ways of, of thinking about housing and valuation effects in particular. Um, so I was showing uh, total return on wealth. So this orange line is going to be the main um, conceptual object that we're interested in. That's the total return on world wealth um, in a world where there is one return on all assets. Uh, but there's also been a lot of interest in the safe return, uh, which is plotted here in the red line. And that's seen a very big decline since the 1980s, which has been much talked about. Um, 
But if you're looking in the historical context, because safe real interest rates were relatively low in the 60s and 70s, uh, the trend isn't so obvious. Right? And so in the paper, we're going to be focusing on total return on wealth. Um, but we have an extension of the paper where we also think about demographic pressure on the difference between the total return and the safe return. And so I'll be able to address that if there's questions at the end of the presentation. The last trend that we've been, we're interested in is this big increase in so-called global imbalances, uh, which here I'm, sh I'm showing as the ratio of a country's net international investment positions to their GDP. And so this is since the 1980s, we've seen uh, very um, uh, big increases in those global imbalances and that the United States has been running a large current account deficit that's accumulated to a big negative uh, international investment position, while countries like Germany and Japan have been accumulating very large assets abroad. So in this paper, we want to think about the causal relationship between demographics and these macroeconomic trends. And our starting point is that there seems to be broad agreement that demographics has contributed to these historical trends um, in wealth to GDPs, net foreign asset imbalances, and real returns, but a lot of disagreement as to how much. So if you think about, say, if you ask economists the question, consider the change in the real interest rate that has been caused by demographics between 1970 and 2020. So that's a simple question, and some a number of papers have been going after that question. Um, if you ask a neoclassical growth model, I would tell you it's zero. It's the only way in which population aging matters in the neoclassical growth model is via the growth rate of the population. And that does not affect in the neoclassical model the real interest rate. So no effect at all in a benchmark model. Um, but in models that build in inelastic asset demand to think more carefully about these questions, there's wide disagreement. And so uh, an influential paper from uh, the, the Federal Reserve Board uh, suggests uh, the contribution of demographics to the fall in our star has been less than 1%, uh, while uh, another important paper in this literature suggests it's been more than 3%. Right? So kind of widespread disagreement as to what's happened historically. And there is even more disagreement as to what's going to happen going forward. Um, in fact, there is a very influential hypothesis out there that those trends might be reverting. And that hypothesis is centered on the idea of what's happening to the savings rate in an age population. So this is a quote from a recent speech by the ECB chief economist uh, that summarizes the consensus saying a large population cohort saving for retirement is putting upward pressure on the total savings rate. So implicitly downward pressure on interest rates. That's kind of what's happened until now. But then he mentions that a large elderly cohort may be pushing down on aggregate savings by running down accumulated wealth. And so going forward, we might, we might see increases in interest rates from demographics. That's kind of the consensus from um, uh, this side of the literature. And this brings back uh, old hypotheses in the, in the economic literature, one uh, that uh, Jim Poterba in the 2000s called the asset market meltdown hypothesis. So there was a lot of work uh, at the time in the 90s on what might happen when baby boomers retire and they start selling a lot of assets and putting downward pressure on valuations and upward pressure on interest rates. So there was a hypothesis back then uh, that uh, Jim Poterba captured as the asset market meltdown hypothesis. And very recently, a book by Charles Goodhart uh, has been arguing that there is going to be a great demographic reversal. And one of the leading hypotheses in that book is the idea that demographics are going to start pushing up on interest rates going forward. So in order to settle these disagreements and try to bring some clarity as to the quantitative magnitude of the effect of demographics, uh, in this model, we're gonna propose a new approach. So this is kind of the new contribution of this paper is a sufficient statistic approach to thinking about the effect of demographics on these big trends. So what I'm gonna show you is that in a baseline model, it's going to be a multi-country general equilibrium overlapping generations model, so GEOLG. Uh, the effect of demographic change on interest on total returns of interest rates, uh, wealth to GDPs and NFAs is going to depend only on things that we can observe in cross-sectional data and two elasticities. So what are the things we can observe? There are cross-sectional age profile of asset accumulation, labor income, and consumption, which you could compute from existing surveys in lots of countries. 
and demographic projections that you can get from the United Nations or any agency that is uh, tasked with projecting the age distribution. Uh, and then we need two elasticities, the elasticity of intertemporal substitution, which I'll write one over sigma, and the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor. Um, and in the baseline case, this is all that we're going to need. So it'll provide us with a framework for measurement uh, and then we'll implement this measurement in the data to see how much uh, we're, we're expecting, say, interest rates to change and, and, and the phase to change. Now, this is going to be a simplified model in some dimensions. So it'll capture a lot of the elements that are there in standard uh, structural models, um, but it'll also abstract away from some others. And so uh, what we show in the second part of the paper is that the quantitative conclusions that we reach from this approach uh, are very robust to plausible extensions of the baseline model. And so in order to explain the main results, let me illustrate how the model works um, in just one picture. So this is a picture that summarizes the determination of world interest rates, the R that I've been talking about, the total return on world wealth, um, as the intersection between a world asset supply curve and a world asset demand curve. So in a baseline, asset supply is, uh, and, and notice that this is normalized by GDP on the x-axis. Uh, that just facilitates the analytics and helps us uh, think kind of coherently about the effects of demographics uh, as just affecting asset demand. Um, so asset supply is a neoclassical asset supply uh, where firms are providing capital um, and um, when they're deciding how much capital to have, uh, they're looking at the user cost of capital. Uh, if interest rates are falling, that's pushing down on the user cost of capital, leading firms to accumulate more capital. And as is well known, this effect, it's a neoclassical effect, it depends on the elasticity of substitution between labor and capital. So we can characterize the slope of this asset supply curve that I'm showing here. So think of the slope here. Um, that's uh, ES. Uh, we can characterize this as um, the uh, as just a function of observables and um, and the elasticity of a substitution between capital and labor. Now that's completely standard in a neoclassical model. What is new to this type of general equilibrium overlapping generations framework is the asset demand curve. In a completely standard neoclassical model, that curve would be flat. Um, and, but in the model that we write down, it's a model where people accumulate assets for life cycle reasons and for, for precautionary savings reasons. And there is a certain inelasticity to that asset demand curve. Um, but it turns out that in our baseline model, the slope of that asset demand curve, so this is going to be the slope uh, ED, uh, is going to just depend on the elasticity of intertemporal substitution and observables. It's going to be typically upward sloping because the substitution effect of interest rates will tend to dominate the income effect of interest rates uh, for plausible uh, cases in the data right? and plausible values of the elasticity of substitution. And so in general, the reason why when you increase interest rates, there is more wealth uh, that's accumulated by agents uh, is because of this dominant substitution effect. There could be a dominant income effect leading them to, um, uh, to accumulate less assets uh, but that only happens for very low values of the elasticity of substitution. Okay, so in so the, the new result here is our ability to characterize these, these two slopes, right? and in particular, the slope of the asset demand curve. Now, how do we think of demographics in this picture? Well, it turns out because I've normalized um, asset supply by, uh, by output, Asset supply is not affected by demographics. The only thing that demographics changes is the asset demand curve. And the second result in the paper is that we can measure the shift in the asset demand curve. So the total amount of wealth to GDP ratios that households would want to accumulate in the long run if interest rates did not change purely as a function of cross-sectional data and population projections. And that's because in, in the baseline model, all of the effects of demographics are going to be compositional effects. They're just going to, so demographics will change the number of people at different ages, but it will not change the, the decisions that people make at different ages. Uh, and so from knowledge of their current decisions and projections of population, uh, of, of population going out, we're going to be able to measure how much more wealth will be demanded 
uh, in the world as a whole at constant interest rates. So that's a number that's going to be very large and positive in the data as I'll show you. So very large and positive. So there is upward pressure on total desired W over Y as a given interest rate. And so as you see, if the configuration of the slopes looks like what the picture gives us, then it must imply that in equilibrium, interest rates are falling and the wealth to GDP ratio for the world as a whole rises. And in addition, from all the numbers that I've given you, we can just compute the effect on world interest rates and the effect on world wealth uh, using uh, the shift in the asset demand curve and the sum of the elasticities. So that's uh, this framework for measurement that I was talking about. We have a very simple way of relating from observables and elasticities to projected effects on our star, projected effect on uh, world, ac world, ac wealth accumulation. Could I just, so these are, I, I'm guessing this is uh, OLG without bequests because then the number of children enters. And I'm right. guessing you're in the steady state uh, capital. So we're not worrying about capital accumulation and transitions. Is that correct? Correct. So yeah, so this characterizes the long run. Uh, and then we'll, um, we'll show the whole transition. Um, so where capital will be accumulated in the transition, possibly with some adjustment costs. Um, the, you're, you're absolutely right that the baseline framework here, in order for this to just be compositional effects, has to uh, ignore bequests. Um, and that's actually an important feature of wealth accumulation that a lot of um, literature has ar argued. So we'll enrich the model with bequests uh, when we reach to the quantitative, um, quantitative section. So in the baseline model, there's no bequests, uh, but there is life cycle accumulation motives and precautionary motives. Adrian, I mean, you're focusing on the steady state, but when I think about the demographic evolutions and there's basically two, there's the baby boomers, but eventually that goes away. That's just a lump which goes through, but it disappears in steady state. And then the other is a steady increase in life expectancy, which you know continues over time, unless you assume that it will end at some point. So when you talk about steady state, I'm a bit confused as to what you So here I'm thinking about a steady state that you might be reaching around 2300, uh, where there might be even declining population growth, but the the the, the changes in nat natality and changes in um, in uh, kind of mortality by age have settled to some constant. That's typically how those population projections is, are done. So you're right that there is big momentum uh, of demographics. So it takes a long time to reach the demographic steady state. Uh, but uh, typically, I believe demographers think that in the very very long run, like a nice sort of starting point is to think that we'll reach a place where we've settled in terms of mortality rates by age uh, and uh, population uh, growth rates uh, across countries. So we have a steady state where all countries have the same population growth rate, but possibly negative, um, and, um, and the same mortality profile by age. Um, so that's the steady state that I'm, I'm talking about. Now, you're completely right that you cannot think of uh, demographics as just a steady state phenomenon. And so a lot of the analysis in the paper is about those transitions. Um, but it'll turn out that the, the steady state analysis is very helpful uh, for thinking about the transition as well in terms of magnitudes. So we'll, we'll be able, to, in particular, to this compositional effect metric that I have, it's a metric that also holds for transitions. And, and so um, and it, it, it works well to help us approximate the effect on uh, interest rates and wealth along the transition. Too. Thanks, Yadrian. Um, Michael here. Uh, on this point, it's not super important for what you're doing, but there's been a debate for many years among medical researchers on whether there's an upper asymptote to life expectancy. To oversimplify it, some people believe that the maximum number of times a cell can divide comprise an upper asymptote. Others don't believe that. Mm -hmm. Maybe something that you want to think about. It's not a huge issue for what you're doing over your time frame, but um, yeah. So whether the changes in the mortality curves by age, uh, where so yeah. if, you're, if, if I'm just thinking of yeah. this is age and this is survival probability, right? There is there's this hypothesis about a rectangularization, something that would look like this in the long run, where maybe around age 120, we yeah. Uh, but that's that's been called the moment it looks like this, and it's kind of being pushed up like this. Yeah, but there's a, uh, uh, I think probably the dominant view among. Uh, medical researchers is that there isn't an upper asymptote anymore, but that's not, doesn't mean it's right. Is that right? 
So that's really interesting. So, so it doesn't matter for us because in my baseline, and just full disclosure, in the baseline model where it's all just composition, I'm going to assume that the, the red curve here is, is fixed over time. So I'm, I'm going to assume away uh, improvements in, um, in mortality at, by di uh, at different ages. So I'll just I'll assume that population uh, distributions come from changes in fertility. Um, and, and later, and, and that's because that allows me to isolate this composition effect. If, if your mortality risk changes, your own mortality risk changes over time, then we expect your decisions to change over time, say because you know that you'll survive too longer and so you have to accumulate more wealth. Um, so in my quantitative model, I'll be able to measure that effect. And um, it'll turn out that that's an effect that depends on um, you know, the, the strength of your bequest motive as well and the extent to which your bequest motive attenuates when you uh, survive to uh, longer ages. Um, but uh, for the, the baseline framework I'm talking about where I can do this sufficient statistic, I'm actually assuming a way, I'm just assuming that this curve is fixed. Right? So baseline fixed. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll feed in improvements in longevity along uh, the transition in the quantitative model. And Adrian, sorry, hi, this is Elena. A quick question about the assumptions of behind the comparative statics exercise. How about technology, in particular, labor efficiency? So um, are you assuming the there's, there's constant, um, I'm, I'm assuming that there's constant improvement in, um, in, in uh, technology, in uh, units of, uh, you know, per efficient unit of work. Um, and then I am taking into account the fact that people at different, of different ages provide different efficiency units of work, as in a standard, uh, on the standard macro model. And so the effect that Olivier was mentioning, the demographic dividend is, is really there. So in the early part of my sample, I see a big demographic dividend where lots of, um, uh, lots of high efficiency unit people are entering the labor force. And then more recently, the, the effect of the demographic dividend goes away and going out to the rest of the 21st century, we see a decline in, uh, in the efficiency units of labor provided to the labor market. So, but this is compositional. They say the efficiency of a group is constant over time. The efficiency of different ages is constant yeah. over time in the baseline. Um, and then, so you're pointing out these are all deviations from the baseline we're talking about. So this is a deviation uh, that has to do with say potentially uh, improvements in um, in uh, health that make you more productive later in ages over time. Uh, as well as maybe changes in retirement ages, um, all of these things would um, all of these the extension would be departure from a, a composition effect, right? So, um, and so that's you, will you be able to talk about them? I, I just miss whether you're abstracting from them or is part of the augmented model that okay. will come so after the baseline. Augmented model takes this into account: changes okay. changes in life expectancy and improvements in health. Thank yeah. you. Uh, great. So I talked about how we can from this framework project out interest rates and increases in world wealth, uh, but I, we also have results on uh, global imbalances. Right? So the way to think about global imbalances is that every country in the world is providing their contribution to the total increase uh, in asset demand um, that depends on their own, the pressure on their own demographics uh, on, on the world as well as their relative uh, size in, in uh, world GDP. Um, and so you can think of uh, what's happening in the data as there's some countries where there is a, a, an aging transition that's almost up over, like Japan. In those countries, we're not projecting much of an increase in further increase in asset demand. It's going to be positive, but not very large. So think of this as the green line. Um, and then countries like China and India, uh, where there's big projected increases in asset demand. Um, and so uh, the, the curve that I was showing you earlier is an average of all these different curves. Right? Um, but the country specific shifts are very large and heterogeneous. So what does that imply for equilibrium? In equilibrium, interest rates will have adjusted uh, such that there is no net foreign asset position for the world as a whole. Uh, but some countries will be running very large and positive net foreign asset positions and some countries will be not large and negative. And it will turn out that um, provided that elasticities are not too different across countries, which we verified in the data, the net foreign asset positions of countries out to the 21st century can be very well predicted by the simple difference between the country's composition effect and the average composition effect. And so that's kind of a data, that's just a pure data object, 
that we are going to be able to use to project out uh, global imbalances. Uh, and we'll find that those end up being very large by the end of the 21st century. All right, so to conclude, the main messages of this paper are, first, interest rates always fall. So that's refuting this um, asset market meltdown hypothesis. The wealth to GDP ratio is always rising, and we get very large global imbalances uh, by the end of the 21st century. OK, so very briefly, let me mention how this relates to existing literature for those of you uh, who are interested. There's really two big literatures on demographics that we connect to. One is a reduced form literature uh, that ha has used these compositional type of analyses or shift share exercises to think about things like projected asset demand uh, or projected savings rate uh, or projected labor supply, and in particular, the demographic dividend literature that Olivier was mentioning. Um, but that's typically not a general equilibrium literature. So it's a literature that does simple projections and tries to argue uh, that those are relevant for general equilibrium, but without a full framework. And so we provide the full general equilibrium framework uh, to justify these kinds of exercises. And more concretely, we show that it's actually a ratio of projected asset demand to projected labor supply that you want to be using. And then there's a very large structural literature that is based on fully specified overlapping generations models uh, that thinks about um, developments in wealth, capital flows, or interest rates. Uh, but that literature doesn't quite so directly connect to the data in the way that we do. And so we have this bridge between the two that we hope um, provides a nice kind of contribution and addition to this broader literature. Uh, Adrian, can I quickly ask you? So essentially, you're saying that the, that the trade uh, imbalances that we see are, are driven by uh, differences in, uh, in uh, demographic composition. Um, does that mean that, and is it true that Germany is demographically more like China than the US? Because yeah. Germany has a, has a big surplus in China as well, right? Yeah, so the, the, so, but you have to think about the, the whole transition as being relevant for the current um, level of the German and that foreign asset position. And so kind of historically, it's, so it's not about a static point in time. It's really about the accumulation of demographic transition over time. So I'll I'll, um, I'll show you some I'll show you some projections for Germany versus okay. China, and you'll see that it, it's very different. Okay. So let me briefly talk about this baseline environment in which we live in, and many of you have already <laughs> anticipated. Um, so interest rates are equated across the world. Productivity is the same across the world. Correct. So all the sort of traditional uh, reasons for trade, you know. You need, factories in India aren't as productive as factories in the United States, but we're going to abstract from all that. Right? We're abstracting from all of that in order to isolate the causal effect of demographics. Right. So we're, we just want a framework that says, if demographic changes and only that, what would be the causal effect on all of our outcomes of interest? And so we're going to be abstracting away from this. And so uh, that's actually a great um, lead into this slide, uh, which kind of states the main assumption. So we have. Uh, a model which is overlapping generations where there's demographic change um, and many countries, all of which face the same interest rate. Um, so there, it's a completely frictionless uh, model in that dimension. And there's also just one good that's being produced by all these countries. So the key richness of the model is on demographics. Uh, and so for now, we're going to assume that there is an exogenous but time varying sequence of births. And, and so that's fertility changing over time. That's going to create big effects, uh, big change, changes in the age distribution. Uh, but for now, um, and this is, uh, uh, you know, in answer to Michael's question earlier, um, the the mortality rates by age are going to be held constant. Uh, in, and in addition, we won't have any migration country by country. Uh, so those are two assumptions we, of course, want to relax but they're going to provide us with a very nice uh, baseline. So on the production side, it's a sim simple neoclassical model with an aggregate production function that takes in capital and effective labor and labor augmenting technology grows at the same rate across countries. So that's not a reason for trade across countries um, in, in, um, in efficiency units. The, the, it's, all these countries are experiencing the same growth rate. Um, and then there's perfect cap competition and free capital adjustment. Governments uh, in all of these countries um, run a tax and transfer system, uh, and they also do some government spending. Uh, and so on the tax side, 
they're levying a certain constant tax rate on, on labor income. And so notice here tau is not indexed by T. Um, and they're running also a tax and transfer system. So think of this as capturing both unemployment insurance, uh, but also social security, very importantly. Um, and um, the, um, the way in which I've written the social, the social security system uh, can depend in an arbitrary way on your age, uh, as well as your the, your idiosyncratic state, so that might be capturing, say, if you're unemployed, uh, but it doesn't change over time once it's normalized by wages. So those are two very important assumptions that are going to help us um, argue that it's all going to be composition, uh, because demographics in this model puts pressure on the government budget constraint. Uh, there's going to be less tax income and more social security transfers but the way in which the government adjusted, adjusts in this baseline is by balancing its budget over time, just adjust, adjusting government spending or the amount of bonds. Um, so in the long run, it has to adjust government spending now or in the future, uh, but it's not using um, the tax instruments uh, to adjust to demographic imbalances. That's of course a very big assumption that we'll want to relax, but it'll help us make the case for uh, our, our baseline results. Adrian, does that government spending mm -hmm. show up in utility or is it just thrown in the ocean? Or? Uh, that doesn't matter for us. It could show up in the utility separately um, and then it wouldn't affect uh, household decisions. If it showed up in the utility function, non separable with consumption, so if it affected the marginal utility of consumption, uh, then that would, that would matter. Um, but it, so it is the result, to me to understand it, as we move to old and we can't afford social security anymore, we're not gonna raise taxes or cut transfers, we're gonna just spend less, that's the... We'll spend less, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's an optimistic view if you want, but it's, uh, um, it's one that uh, allows us to you know, cleanly isolate the effect of demographics that does not run via changing life cycle motives because of changes in social security or changes in taxes. Adrian, uh, modeling strategy. Why introduce the government? Is it because you're going to have pay-as-you-go retirement systems or some other reason? I would have started without, mm -hmm. and then I would have introduced it, but you have it on the first slide. So there must be some deep reason why you started there. Uh, so I think Social Security is, is critical for thinking about um, demographics. <laughs> and so... Uh, the reason is I want to be able to say, I don't want to say I'm completely ignoring social security. It can be there, um, but it's not getting adjusted in a particular way. You know, so, uh, you're completely right though, Olivier, and I agree with you that I could have started with that government and the points would have been the same. Um, it, it, the only thing is that one might immediately say this model is not even uh, plausibly capturing life cycle motives because say there's no social security at all, so you have to entirely say for your own uh, retirement. Whereas in this model, uh, people of age 80 get some social security, and so that mitigates in the baseline the uh, extent to which they have to save on their own. So it's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's to be quantitatively more realistic, um, uh, relative to the baseline where this would be absent, but I agree with you that I could have also abstracted away from it to, to begin with, just to um, make the point. Okay, so uh, this is the slide with the most math, uh, but I just want to kind of introduce you uh, to the, the problem that our households are solving. Uh, so these are uh, different cohorts of agents uh, that uh, know that they're, um, they have a certain number of years ahead of them and they know their own mortality profile. So they have a certain survival probability, which is this phi, uh, and then they're discounting the future more uh, to the extent that they, they will be more likely to be dead at uh, in future ages. So that's captured by this cumulative phi, big phi. Um, um, in addition, uh, they discount the future at the, the, using standard time discounting beta. Um, and they can also have time varying um, marginal utility shifters. So you can think of this, often uh, uh, people think of this as very important to fit the data on consumption over ages. Uh, say your children are with you in your household at a point in time, and that's affecting your marginal utility cons of consumption at that age. Um, that's, and so that's affecting your savings motives throughout your life. Um, so we're allowing for all these motives. Um, and then um, 
and then the, the rest is consumption smoothing, um, where you're facing um, multiple um, sources of risk um, and time variation in your income over time. So your income is given by your efficiency units at different ages. So that's the L. Um, and so that's going to vary by age on average, uh, according to the standard schedules of uh, how productive people are at different ages. Um, and also uh, potentially because of idiosyncratic risk. Um, and so we're, we're building in the possibility that say um, you might be unemployed at a point in time. And so you're saving uh, in order to sustain your consumption during the, those dates. And then we're allowing for this tax and transfer system, which is arbitrary here. Uh, as Olivier was mentioning, I could have just started this model without the idiosyncratic risk and without the tax and transfer system and the points would have been the same. It's just a little bit more general this way. I'm also allowing for a borrowing constraint uh, on uh, what um, households, um, on, on household choices. And so overall, your resources at a point in time are your total income um, and your income, your labor income, and then your income from assets. And then you're using the sum of these two uh, to, uh, you're, you can choose to consume that or to save that for the future subject to that constraint. So that, what, what is Z sub J and Z super J? Z, so Z super J is the history of all the Z's all the way to J. Uh, so this is just more, okay. a little bit more general in that your, your, your transfers can be made contingent on your whole history of shocks. Um, say disability insurance, for example, would, would be captured by this. And Z are idiosyncratic individual shocks, okay. They're idiosyncratic and they're also indexed by your age, yeah. So that's, Thank that you. builds in that generality. So the, the, the idea of this model is that it is able to capture a lot of the reasons why we think people save. Uh, we think that they save for retirement. Uh, we think that they save for a precautionary saving reason. We think that borrowing constraints prevent them from smoothing perfectly consumption over their ages. We think that they might save because they have kids in, house, in the household at different points in time or you know, save less or be able to save less. Uh, all of these forces are in there. Right? And so in particular, that's a model that can be fitted uh, to uh, consumption data over ages and that will be able to fit the, the consumption profile. And so why do your wages multiply your transfers? So this is, um, this is just a normalization of the transfers. You can think of it this way, um, but the the key oh. assumption I'm making is that when the when the government faces pressure on its budget constraint because of demographics, it's not adjusting the wage normalized transfer. So it's it's scaling up all all, um, all transfers by the current wage, um, and that's that's uh, hence the notation. So so Adrian, you you mentioned the social security for. Is that supposed to be captured by the transfers? Exactly. Social security is in the transfers. And so okay. a, a simple way to model secu social security is just after a certain age, say after a retirement age, uh, you get a baseline sure. of a transfer. Um, and yeah. then we finance that using taxes. The, ta the tax rate comes here. So we finance that during ta using taxes on labor income during your uh, during the time. Just the pay as you go year. system. Yeah. That's a pay-as-you-go system, so that's nested in here. Quick question, sorry, Adrian. So, are taxes linear here? Yes, yes. Uh, taxes on labor income are linear. Yeah, but why so? You know, I, yeah. could, I could allow I could allow for nonlinear tax schedule via the transfer system. So I could I could say, but th this wouldn't be marginally. So the marginal tax rate is always constant. Right? Um, but I allow I'm, I'm allowing for a, a transfer system that can be progressive overall um, is just that it wouldn't be uh, at the margin, uh, it wouldn't affect marginal tax rates. So it builds in all this richness, which Olivier was kind of correctly seeing is uh, some of it is, is not necessary for the main point I want to make here, uh, but it's useful because it, it, it says this is a model that can actually fit the data. Okay, so a, a, a big assumption I, I've, I've made here is that agents can use um, annuities and they do use annuities as in Olivier's old work. So the, the, um, you, you'll notice here that the return on your assets at a given age is uh, blown up. It's increased by the, uh, the survival probability. Uh, so or divided by the survival probability. So if you're less likely to survive, you get a bigger return. 
that's because you can use an annuity that just pays if you survive. Um, that's um, a trick uh, that uh, this literature has been using to abstract away from, from uh, unintended bequests. If you don't have this, then um, there is a certain amount of wealth that's held by agents that die, and you have to decide uh, who that wealth goes to. So it could be collected to the government. Typically, it's distributed as bequests. Uh, we'd call them unintended bequests, so bequests that were not planned, and we have to deal with that. So in the baseline, we're not um, we're just saying agents could uh, invest in annuities, uh, so we don't have to deal with this issue, and in the quantitative model, we'll relax that. Okay, so uh, how does equilibrium work here? So given demographics and policy in an integrated world equilibrium, all our households are optimizing, firms optimize, and global market, asset markets are clearing. Um, so the global clearing of asset markets says that total world wealth, which here I've just rewritten uh, using country GDP weights and then the wealth to GDP for each country, total asset demand is equal to total asset supply. And so this is the other place where the government comes in, which is it, ac it actually supplies some of the assets that people save in. Right? So there is, uh, there is capital, and then there is some government bonds that people can save in. Can, can I just, I'm confused on how are the government bonds net wealth here? Because people have to pay the taxes to pay off those government bonds. Yeah, but they, they don't have to pay them. Well, it's not necessarily them, right? So, um, and the, so here there is incomplete markets and oh you're that, just going to take those you're going to take those out of the income stream as they come okay i got the accounting yep that's right that's right um okay so we're going to be thinking of two cases uh one is a little bit of a uh, kind of a, a thought experiment um but it's helpful to construct the general equilibrium case <laughs> a thought experiment in which a small country with a weight of zero in world gdp is aging on its own uh, with the world at a steady state. So the world at a steady state means that the interest rate is constant. Um, and then that's just this country on its own experiencing this demographic transition. And we want to project out the effect that, uh, that the demographic transition has on its wealth and its net foreign asset position. Um, so that's a thought experiment that helps us think about the effect on asset demand. And then we'll put all countries aging together, converging to a steady state with a certain long run interest rate. And so that leads us to all the key results in the paper. So the first one is that for that small country aging on its own, so it's facing a constant real interest rate and a constant uh, growth rate of labor augmenting uh, productivity. The path of its wealth to GDP ratio is just given by the ratio of two shift chairs. Right? So the numerator in that shift chair is um, constructed as follows. Take at a point in time, we'll say it's date zero, say today, uh, take the cross-sectional age profile of asset accumulation, and then integrate that with respect to a time-varying age distribution. That gives you a time-varying numerator. So over time, say as um, there's more old people, uh, the W is going to go up from this effect. And then you take the ratio to um, the, the, the same exercise, but done using the average pre-tax labor income profile. So that captures the efficiency units of labor that different agents are provided, uh, providing at a point in time. And so that captures the demographic dividend effect that we were talking about. Okay. So once you've taken the ratio, that gives you the evolution over time in that economy in general equilibrium of the wealth to GDP. Okay. So what's the general equilibrium demographic impact over time for that thought experiment where the small country is aging on its own, no effect on the world interest rate and the wealth to GDP ratio, as well as the net foreign asset position to GDP ratio for that country is just given by this simple metric that I can measure in the data. Right? So measurable from demographic projections and household surveys. Right, so what's the intuition? And I think it, a lot of you already got the intuition, but the intuition is demographics here via time varying fertility are not affecting normalized individual decisions. So once we normalize appropriately by growth, all that's happening is agents are making the same decisions over time at a given age. Um, and then what demographics is doing is that it's changing the number of people at different in different age buckets. And so it's telling us, and so, so to project out the total effect on demand for wealth to GDP, uh, we can just project out the age distribution holding decisions constant. And so that's the compositional effect of demographics that I was talking about. 
Okay, so now put this into a world equilibrium. All countries are aging. All countries are increasing their wealth to GDP demand. Uh, interest rates have to fall. And the extent to which they have to fall is given by the ratio of the average world composition effect by the sum of the average uh, asset uh, demand and supply sensitivities. Um, and uh, similarly, the wealth to GDP ratio is the product of that, that number that I get from the data by the ratio of the supply elasticity to the sum of the supply and demand. So this is really standard static supply demand analysis applied to the long run. Uh, and further, if I want to think about the change, um, there's a typo, there should be a change here, in the net foreign asset position, um, it's just given by the difference between the compositional effect for that country and the world compositional effect as a whole, provided that the elasticities across countries are similar, right? So this is something we can verify in the data. It'll give us our nice way of just projecting out net foreign assets just from um, the, uh, the compositional effect data. So the final thing I need to tell you in that ingredient, and then I'll show you results, is how are these elasticities determined? So on the supply side, because I'm assuming bonds are not changing divided by GDP in the long run. The only thing that matters for changes asset supply is the ratio, uh, is, the, is, is, sorry, the, is the supply side elasticity. So the neoclassical elasticity of capital uh, provision to the user cost. And so that's something that depends, on, that depends only on the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor, the, the user cost of capital. So the, the depreciation rate here, Delta, and the capital to GDP ratio for the world as a whole. So things that we can observe. And then there's an important um, result in the paper that tells us what the slope of the asset, uh, so, uh, the asset demand elasticity is. Um, and so as I was saying at the beginning, the way to think about in the long run, how much wealth of people accumulate at different ages um, for a given interest rate is given by a race between a substitution effect and an income effect. So if interest rates are falling, you'll want to accumulate less wealth from the standard substitution effect reason. Uh, but then you might also be experiencing an income effect. Say you're trying to sustain wealth in retirement. If interest rates are lower, now you may be uh, led to save more uh, in order um, to sustain that wealth in retirement. Right? And so it turns out that it is possible uh, to write down the substitution effect and the wealth effect uh, in general. And here I'm showing you the special case where the formulas are particularly clean, just based on the, the elasticity of interchangeable substitution and observable components from age profiles. So the variance of the age of consumption, um, which is, you think of the age of consumption as a distribution, um, and you can take the variance of that distribution, um, that is scaling the substitution effect and then the difference between the average age of assets and the average age of consumption gives you the sign of the income effect. So those have a lot of intuition and I'm happy to get into it if you're interested, but it just turns out it's kind of a beautiful formula. Uh, we can just look at cross-sectional age profiles of consumption and assets and, and determine in a baseline model, uh, the strength of the substitution effect versus the strength of the income effect. So notice this comes with a negative here. And in the data, this term is positive. So overall, the income effect will be negative. So there is a lot of arguments out there that if interest rates fall, maybe people will end up saving more. And there's some truth to it in that in the data, it looks like the income effect is in fact going against the substitution effect, right? So if the elasticity of intertemporal substitution is zero, um, then, um, or if the variance of the age of consumption was zero, this would be if everybody consumed only at one age and not at any other age, then the argument for a dominant income effect might um, prevail. But in the data, it will turn out that for any plausible value of the elasticity of intertemporal substitution, the substitution effect dominates. Right? And so people accumulate more assets when interest rates are higher or will not accumulate as many assets if interest rates are lower. Um, Okay, so that's the end of the theoretical part. So let me talk, turn to measurement and then implications. Okay, so the, um, the exercise that I've built, it, it's one that allows us to go to measurement. And, um, and so we, in the paper, we spend a lot of time harmonizing data from cross-sectional surveys across lots of countries in order to be able to construct the key objects that are needed for the theory. So one is this shift chair, um, which is the, um, the, the compositional effect I was talking about earlier. 
And so the way that we implement this in the data is we say, well, let's take you know, PKT and Zuckman's best estimates of the wealth to GDP ratio at a point in time. And then we'll take age, wealth, and labor income profiles in a base year and augment that uh, with projections of age distributions over individuals from the UN world po population prospects. So here there's a number of assumptions you have to make because the surveys measure wealth for households, whereas we care about individual projections. And so we end up attributing wealth uh, to, um, to adult households in the individuals, for example. Uh, sorry, in adult individuals in the household, for example. Um, and then there's also questions about what you want to include in wealth. So in principle, the funded part of defined benefit pension is something that should, should be counted. And so we do the best we can to, to count that as part of uh, the, the ages. Okay, so once we've done this exercise, this is the projection that we can make for the wealth to GDP ratio at constant interest rates just from composition in the United States. And so what I'm showing you here, I'm, I'm doing this baseline exercise in 2016. And then I look at going forward population projections, but I can also go back. And I can also say, if the age distribution was the age distribution in 1950, what would wealth to GDP have been just coming out of composition? Right? And so what you see from this graph is the numbers are really large. So it is, it is a very big effect just from age composition um, on, the, on the wealth to GDP ratio. Um, and in particular, it's large relative to the actual historical evolution of the wealth to GDP ratio. Uh, so this is data from the World Income Database by Piketty and Zuckman. Uh, so the wealth to GDP ratio has risen by about 100% of GDP historically. And our baseline model suggests that Composition effects can account for a lot of that. So just from composition, just from the fact uh, that we've seen increasing numbers of older people um, that uh, tend to have more assets, uh, we get a positive effect. So Adrian, let me add. Sorry, Adrian, you say low fertility and high fertility. Fer fertility has moved, but what really has moved is life expectancy, mm -hmm. which, is, which has different effects conceptually. So how should I, I interpret that diagram? Well, so, so going forward, um, so first of all, uh, you're completely right that life expectancy has changed partly because of change improvements in mortality at different ages, but a lot of the misses in population project, in, in age distribution projections historically ha have been due to misses in infertility projections. So the baby boom, for example, was completely missed by demographers earlier, and that completely changed the age distribution and so when the UN projects out uh, the uh, age distributions, the main baseline scenarios have to do with different projections for fertility. And those have enormous implications for the age distributions in 2100. And so that, that's why I'm, I'm splitting it by fertility. You're right that there's also uncertainty going out as to the mortality rates by different ages. But my understanding uh, is that, that it, there's less uncertainty there. And so, uh, so even though the UN also provides you with alternative projections for mortality, uh, those, are not, um, those are not so central in the main projections. And they are also less influencing the age distribution going out than fertility is. So uh, Adrian, so, Alan Taylor is a question. Alan, do you have a question? Alan Taylor? Yeah, I, I just uh, I like the project very much, Adrian, uh, and and have some similar work uh, you know about. But and thanks yeah, for citing it. Yeah, 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 I'm yeah. just curious as, uh, if you have any insight on why the model uh, kind of misses the data in the interim. Like it's it does poorly up to 1980, kind of under uh, the uh, yeah. it overshoots the data and then it undershoots and it kind of balances out over 50 years. But uh, what, what what's going on there? Do you think? Right. Well, so. One thing that is clearly happening in the data is there's movement in valuations um, and there's movement in interest rates, which I'm, I'm abstracting away here in this baseline. So I'm not surprised that I'm missing out the busts and then the boom. A lot of the high frequency in particular have to do with movements in valuation. Uh, right? And this, this model abstracts away from that. Um, so so I, 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 if you want, I'm, I'm, I'm not so concerned about even the negative co-movement. Um, I, I think of it as quite interesting that we can get the general magnitude, um, but clearly abstracting away from valuation is a very uh, you know, big problem for hitting the data at, at um, high frequencies, yeah. even medium frequencies. 
How about the other countries? Okay, so I'll show you other countries in one second. Let me just kind of break this down for you. So just to, so you understand why, um, the, where our results are coming from. So here, what I'm showing you is for, the, for 2016 in the United States, after I've uh, allocated household wealth to individual wealth, the age profile of household, uh, the age profile of individual asset accumulation, and that's the solid line, versus the age distribution in 2016. And so the key thing that's kind of a key stylized fact is that individuals don't accumulate much wealth uh, until they're about 40, and then there's a very big increase, okay. and, the, uh, and, and they do not decumulate much wealth going out. Right? So there's little wealth decumulation, which goes against our standard models and points to things like bequest motives. Right? Um, and so, um, so what happens to the age distribution? So the key movement in the numerator of our statistic is the age distribution. So what's happening between now and 2100 in the population projections is that there is many fewer individuals uh, that have almost no wealth and a lot more individuals that hold a lot of wealth. And so that's an effect that's pushing a lot on the numerator. It's pushing a lot on desired wealth accumulation just from composition because we see an increasing number of, uh, of agents with large amounts of assets. What's what's happening to the denominator? So this is the labor supply effect. Uh, so that's more subtle um, because early in the sample, so if you're looking in 1950 to today, you have this demographic dividend effect where there's an increasing number of, of uh, individuals that are co it, it, coming into their peak er, uh, age earning years. Uh, but going forward, in fact, the, according to our data, the peak of the demographic dividend was about in 2010. So we ju we're just past it. And going forward, a lot of what's happening is we have more and more um, individuals that are retiring, getting outside of the labor market, no longer contributing efficiency units, no longer contributing to GDP directly. Um, and so that's uh, pushing down on the denominator. Right? So we get two big effects, one big effect from uh, more life cycle accumulation and one big effect from less uh, labor supply, which combine to push up a lot on desired W over Y. So that's what we get in the United States. And then we get this around the world. And so in, um, in the paper, we, we show uh, all the profiles that I just showed you um, for each country. Uh, but here I'm just summarizing the main results from that exercise. Uh, and so you see that across all the countries that we consider, uh, the effect is, is large and positive, but it's also very heterogeneous. And when we break that down by how much is due to differences in age profiles versus how much is due to demographics, demographics comes out as the winner. So the main reason why there's this heterogeneity is because some countries are still quite young and they're projected to age a lot, uh, like China and India to the right over here, versus other countries are close to done with their aging transition. And so they're not projected to contribute much to net asset demand going forward. Right? And so the US stands out somewhere in the middle. here. Right? So these are the numbers. So and, and so think of this as relative to their GDP. So for example, the China number is, if interest rates didn't change, China wealth to GDP would, would increase by, by 2.37. We increased by 237% of GDP um, just from these compositional effects. Uh, so the fact that there'll be more and more older people saving more and, uh, and, and then uh, retiring from the labor market. Okay, so what's, um, what's the consequence for, for the numbers that we care about? So we put in some numbers for substitutability between capital and labor and the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor. This graph shows you as a function of the elasticity of intertemporal substitution, what the asset demand elasticity is. And we were talking about the fact that potentially there's a dominant income effect that only happens at very, very low elasticities of intertemporal substitution. So if you think it's zero, uh, then there could be a dominant income effect. But as soon as you get to the range of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, which macroeconomists think is plausible, you get a positive or dominant substitution effect. Okay. Um, so what's the outcome? So here I'm presenting this in a matrix uh, that um, just uh, takes as inputs the, the elasticities that I was talking about earlier. So capital labor substitution elasticity, uh, eta equals one is Cobb Douglas. So that's what a lot of economists would think is a reasonable benchmark. And then here I've put Bob Hall's favorite number at 0.5 for the elasticity of substitution in the middle 
So if you're thinking, so now remember the exercise is, I look at demographic projections for the world as a whole. And I say, what is going to be the effect on our star, on the equilibrium interest rate in 2100, just from um, the population projections and um, the basic structure of my model? I get a number like 1.18, right? So uh, a contribution to the interest rate fall of 1.18%, which is somewhere in the middle of the range uh, of the literature. But here you can really transparently trace this back to two assumptions, two structural assumptions on the elasticity of capital cost substitution and the elasticity of substitution between capital and labor. Right? And similarly, Piketty has been arguing that there's been going to be a very big increase in wealth to GDP going out because of the fall in population growth rates in particular, pushing down on the growth rate overall. In general equilibrium, that gets attenuated quite a bit um, because there's a fall in interest rates. Um, and so for our best uh, number for the uh, increase in world wealth to GDP as demographics unfold is about 77%. Uh, right. So it's kind of a number that's somewhere in between the range of a neoclassical model, which, which will give you a zero, and the types of numbers that PKT projects. Adrian, can I ask you a couple of questions about the data? I'm thinking about the uh, the borrowing constraints and the difference in taxations across countries. Mm -hmm. And going back to the taxes, they everything that affects wealth accumulation, you would think has an impact for the intensity of the income effect that you're after the retirement age has similar effects. So can you talk about how do you calibrate the model for each country and how to account for the fact that there are countries that are very different transfer and tax schemes? So notice, I mean, here are my, I have, a, I have no calibration of the model because I'm, 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 the only calibration questions are what the substitution elasticities are. Um, and that's it. So everything else is reduced form so I can just take it from the data. So all of the numbers that I gave you I take them from age profiles, country by country. Right? And so if my model is right, then this is all I need. Uh, so I do not need to take a stance on- uh, So the, you're not doing, that's what I was confused. This is this is a reduced form estimated as such and is not validated against a reduced from a, from a mod, from your own model that is calibrated, estimated on informations that pins down the primitive of the country specific model. You're just using the reduced form and measuring the, the effects of interest via the reduced form only. I'm using the theorems that I proved to provide a quantification that just relies on data observables and two elasticities. Yeah. So now I can, I also have for the quantitative part of the paper, I have a full calibration of the model where I need to take a stance on all of the above, all the things that you mentioned. So country specific social security systems, country specific borrowing constraints and so on. So it's a much, and that's, typically what the literature has done, right? And it's very complicated and kind of black box. And so what I would argue is this helps us you know, give transparency uh, as to what's driving the results. You know, here in particular, these two elasticities are key drivers of the results. And then um, we can transparently read up uh, data age profiles, uh, what matters for say the income versus the substitution effect. So Adrian, I have a couple of, First of all, I like this a lot. I think it's really illuminating, uh, despite all the assumptions that have to go into it, et cetera. But I, I have a couple of observations. Um, part of the big change in global saving has been tremendous saving in China, which is, has the highest saving rate of any country in recorded history. But most of that is in state enterprises in the business sector, not in the household sector. Mm. So I don't know if thinking about that affects anything. Um, and if you add heterogeneity, not just across age and across um, countries, but among consumers, among households, then the marginal supplier of capital is going to be the most patient consumer. And that's going to lead you, your OLG model, to kind of move toward a Ramsey-esque um, model, also, also with bequests. And it'd be useful to have some notion of how those things affect very much that would wind up with a with a perfectly elastic supply of capital equal to the Herod neutral rate times the elasticity of margin utility. Right. So all of that, you know, so, so it's just framing the thing before we start doing all that and how how that how thinking about those things would affect the results or what what your response would be in, you know, to deal with any of that. I mean, but, um, 
one one thing that I can support you on is Larry Lau and I have updated our estimates for the G7 countries, and we get very closely the same elasticities of substitution between capital and labor in the G7, all the G7 countries at around 0.8. Um, okay, great. So, that's, so that's great. I'll send that to you. We should be writing it up. Absolutely, yeah, please do. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so, so uh, then, Olivia, Olivia has a question. Olivia? Uh, yeah. Let me collect questions and then I can try to answer all of them. Okay. Um, my question, I mean, you, you may, I don't know how many more slides you have, but I mean, a very tempting question in this, in this context is by how much would the public debt to GDP have to increase to have set the effect on R. Uh, that would be a sense of a world fiscal space. And that's something that I suspect is fairly trivial to do in your model. It's basically a shift in the uh, in the domain curve for, for assets. But Great. maybe you've done it, in which case I would love to know the answer. Yeah, so actually, I, uh, I can show you this graph uh, because that's going to provide the, the your correctly seeing that this is the reverse to the answer to the question. So here I'm saying, if I'm not hold, if I'm holding debt to GDP constant uh, for each country, what is my projection for net foreign asset positions in each of these countries in world equilibrium, right? So it's, it's, it's the answer to your question is going to be similar to this. So, so here, this is projecting out the net foreign asset positions of countries assuming B over Y is constant for all of these countries. And so then this, the savings motives play out and uh, interest rates are just down in equilibrium and we get, um, we get these big global imbalances, right? So now your question is, instead, let me assume that, uh, and, and you're, you're seeing this in the baseline model, what's, what's, what can happen is that there is an exactly offsetting change in, uh, in, in, in world um, B over in world B over Y, that would be enough to stabilize the world interest rate, or we could do this country by country. Um, and we could say, uh, if B increases by the same amount as the compositional effects for each of these countries, uh, then that stabilizes the world interest rate. Right? And, and so the, the types of magnitudes that we're talking about here, they're actually um, exactly, um, you know, they're, 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 they're um, they're, they're plotted in this graph. Or if, if you just want the answer for the United States, actually, I can kind of give it to you from this graph, right? So this graph says, uh, this is the amount by which demographics will put pressure on the interest rate downwards for the United States. If the United States increased its debt to GDP ratio by the same amount, it will provide all the assets that people are looking for to save in. Um, and so we would need to increase the US debt to GDP ratio by 120%. Uh, in order to stabilize the effect on the world on the world interest rate coming from the U.S. Actually, you'd have to increase it by a lot more because well, that is partly that wealth even in an OLG model, right? So when you basically increase that, you would actually also increase the uh, uh, the uh, the taxes that people have to pay later in life. So you don't get Ricardian equivalence, but no, that's right. that's, no, that, no that is not fully net wealth. So but you'd it, have to increase growth that by more than that. But um, I, 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 we, I don't think so because I think that all of the non-net, you know, the fact that that is part of the this model are already in there in that framework. So I, I actually think I can prove that debt would just to need to increase by exactly the same, this amount. I, I can show you from the market clearing condition. That gets back to your assumption that it's other government spending that adjusts, not the tax rate. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, so that's that important. Is. For the U.S., for example, just the medical transfers that are projected in Medicare and Medicaid will basically eventually force, which in your assumption, would basically force you to shut down the rest of the government. Yeah, it's likely that you'd run down <laughs> G's to, to get to a negative level. So we, we're, not, we're not building that constraint that you have to have positive yeah. G. So, so these are things that are probably worth thinking about. Um, I agree. I think the projections for other countries with... Uh, with nationalized healthcare systems, a lot more rationing aren't as severe as in the U.S. Yeah, no. So those are all super great questions. So to your question, Michael, on uh, Ramsey. So one thing is, um, we we want a model that's consistent with the long run, in which in twenty one hundred or twenty three hundred um, countries have a a positive. All each country has a positive share of wealth, right? So if there was t differences in patients across countries. 
then that would lead us to think that one country owns the rest of the world in the long run. And so, um, so we're not, we're, so because of this constraint, if you want, we're not allowing for differences in patients rates across countries, but that's something that is worth thinking about, you know, what, what would happen if we, uh, if we let countries um, have different patients rates and how does that influence our results? Um, and on household versus uh, household savings in China. You're, you're aware I take it of, uh, of the famous exchange between Henry Kissinger and Xiao Enlai. You aware of this? Henry Kissinger? Uh, no, Hen no, I'm not Henry aware. Kissinger asked Xiao Enlai what he thought of the French Revolution when they opened up, when Nixon and Kissinger opened up China. And Xiao Enlai is alleged to have said, Henry says this actually happened. Uh, Xiao Enlai responded, it's too soon to tell. So <laughs> getting back to your patience issue, your time yeah. horizon issue. Yeah, so, I mean, that's a great line. Um, but anyway, but, anyway, it's just something we're thinking about. Oh, absolutely, no, no, really great to think about. And, and I was just gonna mention on the savings rate in China, the, the work by Zili Boti and Storz Latin, they, you know, they, in, in fact, uh, Gorinchas and Ray, also, uh, sorry, Gorinchas and Jan also had some work um, showing that even in China, a lot of the um, kind of the allocation puzzle seems to be related to household savings. So relative to a neoclassical model, um, their, type, their research pointed to household savings as where the neoclassical model was failing and where you'd want to enrich it. So some, with, in, I think a dimension like overlapping generations model, like the, the type of model I've written down is kind of consistent with those um, with the type of results that they were finding. Um, let me just, so that since I know we're close to end of time and I just want to show you one final graph. So this is my NFA projections for the, for the world as a whole. So I, I project um, from the data alone, very large global imbalances by the end of the 21st century, right? Where China and India are running very large uh, net foreign asset positions. Um, of uh, uh, more than 100% of, of their GDP. And then the United States keeps, so the uh, United States already has what some view as problematic, prob problematically low uh, net foreign asset position, large debtor position abroad, but the United States just keeps running current account deficits uh, uh, because its compositional effect is less than the world average um, and then ends up with a very negative uh, NFA. And so one thing you might ask is, well, is this just uh, ivory tower theory, yeah. um, or does it have any bearing to what we've actually seen in terms of changes in NFAs uh, historically? And so this graph kind of answers this question by just looking at a long run historical perspective. So 1970 to 2015. And on the X axis, I'm showing you the compositional effect that we would have predicted just based on our analysis uh, using pure changes in demographic co composition um, uh, for, for this time period. And then on the y-axis, you see what actually happened to the NFAs of these countries over this time period. And so, you know, this is not to say that demographics is the only thing driving, say, the Irish international investment position. Um, and I'm aware that there's lots more that's going into this, but the, the, the fit is pretty good. And we're not so far from the 45 degree line. So, it, so just looking at demographic composition actually goes a long way even historically in explaining the changes in the NFAs that we've seen. So that's... Um, you know, one thing, uh, just this is, uh, this part is very convincing, but the interest rate effects are quite different depending on the asset demand fund. Any, any thought about how we reconcile that difference? So you're saying here, if we're looking at low elasticities of capital labor substitution and low elasticities of international substitution, we could get very large falls in interest rates, right? And whereas if you think the EIS is bigger, um, then, then the effects are not so dramatic. Uh, yeah, and some of the literature expresses that same difference, even larger. Yeah, so I mean, so one thing that's happening here in this framework, right, is if you, if you keep pushing the EIS lower, then you can get very large effects on interest rates because there is no stabilizing effect from savings. Uh, so it's all, it's all on, on, the, on the asset uh, supply side. Um, you know, I think it's, I don't want to take a stand on the elasticity of intertemporal substitution. I, there's been a lot of work trying to estimate it, a lot of disagreement. Macroeconomists tend to think it's relatively small. Finance economists tend to think it's a lot larger. Um, and so I don't see it as my role in this paper to 
try to settle that debate. I can kind of trace out the mapping between parameters and um, and R star estimates. Um, but you know, I think that that somewhere like the middle row, which is where our where our quantitative model also settles in the baseline and our quantitative model, this is what we take because we think that's close to consensus. Um, that's that's pretty realistic if you just ask me to take a bet. But I, I I'd rather give you the whole map. Okay, thank you. I think Olivier may have his hand raised again, and then we have to stop. Olivier, do you have another question? Yeah, apologies, Carl. So many questions, but the um, you basically you're taking the, your conclusion is the total opposite of uh, good heart burden, right? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I'm I'm on your side, but you have something to say about them? I do. I do. So, if I have one more minute, let me just say. People have been talking about falling savings rates and how that might be uh, putting upward pressure on interest rates. And we have an analysis where we actually calculate the compositional effect on savings and we show it's negative across all countries. So if you're just looking at savings rate, you'd be led to think the correct, you know, it's correct to say savings will fall because of a fall because of uh, demographics, right? There's more people that are retire and they have low savings rates, but W over Y is not S over Y, it is S over Y divided by the growth rate. And so as the population ages, that pushes down on savings rate, but it pushes down on the growth rate even more from just the effect on the growth rate of the population. And it is not savings rate that you want to look at when you think about interest rates, it's actually total wealth. And, and so, so total wealth um, goes, um, goes up uh, according to our results, even though the, the numerator and the denominator both go down, but the denominator goes down by more. And so that's uh, that's what I can say about this, which is you have to think of, of a stock perspective rather than a flow perspective if you want to think about our star, and that leads you to think our star will fall. Okay, last questions from Kevin Hassett. Kevin? Yeah, hey, uh, just uh, quickly, when, when going back to Olivier's question, when he was thinking about the increase in debt uh, required to offset uh, the interest rate change from demographics. You know, one of the things we're experiencing right now is probably over the next four or five years, we're gonna see debt to GDP double in the US or so. If you just look at all the stuff that's been going on and assume just a little bit of short-term memory for government spending. And so so what happens in your model if, if you get like, like rather than like in the hypothetical you were thinking about, you were kind of maybe asymptoting the two so that they were offsetting each other kind of in continuous time. If you get a spike in government debt at the beginning, that's equal to the next hundred years of demographic effect. Like, what do you think that would, how that would- oh, I see, yeah, so there'll be a transitional effect on interest rates where the interest rate will spike up in the, in the short run. In that, in yeah, and then it could really explode, right? Because of the substitution effect. So it's a good question, but it, so it depends on your views of, um, of kind of adjustment costs in the short run or adjustment frictions, especially on the capital side. Um, uh, but that's an interesting question and something we can ask our structural model: How much within the short run interest rates increase if you increase it? You know, if you increase government uh, debt to GDP by as much as we're seeing. Um, but in the long run, as we said, it, it would stabilize. So if B over Y you know, 100 years from now is 100% more than it is today, that would completely be fine from this perspective. In the short run though, it would put probably severe upward pressure on the interest rate. So we, uh, we're beyond time, we have to stop. Uh, this is terrific. Thank you, Adrian, appreciate Thanks it. So much.